Good morning, amazing people. Hope you're doing well. Thank you again for listening to the podcast. I realized I wanted to throw this one in at the beginning of the episode on because I know some of you may be tuning in, expecting or anticipating some type of comment or some type of coverage of what's going on overseas with Ukraine and Russia. At the time of recording, there just wasn't a lot of information on it and we really didn't want to comment on it. So this episode, if you're anticipating that, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Uh, we don't even so much as hint at the situation. Uh, it's one of those times that we just are going to take our time with it. We don't want to comment on things abroad without all the facts in front of us. Um, just lessons we've learned in our past. So we apologize if that's why you're tuning in. If you're not, I hope you're going to really enjoy this episode with Christopher Stieg. It was a fantastic one. And uh, we again, thank you so much for tuning in. And we hope you have yourself a great morning. And I hope you enjoy this episode. Innovation is in our veins. Soon the whole world will know our names. Sharing our knowledge and freedom reign. We're here for the people, you know it's our way. Setting foundations is part of the dream. It doesn't matter if you're new to the game. Listen up now, cause we all gon' say. Ugh. Elevate, elevate, elevate. Higher, elevate, elevate, elevate. Higher, we gon' rise up. We all gon' shine. Work through adversity, stay on the grind. Elevate, elevate, this is our time. Elevate, elevate. Welcome to the Elevate Podcast, everyone. It's so great to have you all on one more time. It's your boy, Josh Dalton. And we're happy to be back, and it's going to be a fun one today. Yeah. Dude, I'm feeling energized. We've redone the set a little. It, the vibes are impeccable. It's a great Wednesday to be recording. Yeah, you actually got like a solid three or four feet behind you now, which is nice. Dude, it's a good day. Yeah, we love it's to see It's a good day it. to record. It is a fantastic day to record. We're excited. It is Wednesday, <laughs> February 23rd. If you know, if you're from Scotia, you know what that day means. Uh oh. Oh, do, do we, you know? Do we know? Philip, do you know? What? No. Oh, shoot. Restrictions are lifted! <laughs> oh, we know. Oh. No one knows what it means, yeah. but it's provocative. That's the government. It gets gross. the people going. <laughs> that That's Timmy's thing. Yeah. <laughs> Straight up, that's Tim Houston. We have the celebratory Tim Bits up in here. Uh, we are excited. Um, at least I can speak for myself that I'm excited. But at the same time, I also want to get very real. I also know there's people that aren't too excited about it, and I understand I can get that. Um, but when I heard the news, what yeah. was I feeling? What was I feeling? I was feeling, I wasn't like enthused. I was like, yeah. first off, oh, cool. I was like, nice. A, because I think... We've had so many false starts over the course of this pandemic that I'm kind of like, <laughs> yeah, that's whatever. what I thought first. Yeah, I was like, yeah, we'll see. But like the fact they're like really over like promising on this one means there's probably something to it. Yeah, because it's the first time they've come out right away. Like everything's getting dropped. Yeah, and we're just going in, and uh, which is really odd. And starting on the 28th of of March, the expensive Vax Pass is gone. <laughs> yeah, the one <laughs> billion dollar <laughs> Vax Pass is ousted. Those expensive QR codes. Yeah. <laughs> freaking QR codes it's all going and uh so it I was like oh I, I was not enthused I was more so I was reflective I would have to say because I don't know it feels a little symbolic specifically here in Nova Scotia as it's going to be exactly two years when the restrictions get lifted can you believe that the oh, first yeah. thing I saw when it was like March I guess it's 23rd is when the last last thing's done here in Nova Scotia that's which I would assume is the state of emergency will be lifted. Yeah, they're lifting it. Yeah. And there was the thing that you'd sent in our group chat, which was, I guess, a meme, but yeah. just showed that it was Feb March 22nd, mm -hmm. 2020. Yeah. That it started. And I just think back and I was like, I remember like on the March 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, I was like, no, this isn't real. I'm still going to do my thing. I'm going out. I'm going downtown this weekend. I don't care. Like, it's no big deal. And then we all like woke up to emails from our bosses and everything. It was like, work, no, don't, don't come into the office. Like yeah. two weeks, flatten the curve. Dog, this curve better be flat by now, <laughs> dog. This is the longest two weeks of my life. <laughs> For real. Gee. And before I, oh, I, I, I've made the mistake before we get too far and I'll instruct everyone. We also have a guest coming on today. We're doing something a little different where we're actually, because of this happening, uh, we really wanted to take the time to talk about yeah, it. Hot topic. We really wanted just to kind of get everything out before we brought our guest on because today we will be having Chris Versteeg on. Former, I shouldn't say current, I, I don't know. Uh, well, he's 
Two times Stanley yeah. Cup champions. Leave it at that. Um, but also CEO, Turn business owner, entrepreneur. Exactly. He's just doing innovator. all the things, and he's got so many. Uh, he's he's an impressive individual, obviously uh, on the ice, but as well off the ice, he's accomplished a lot in the business world. So we're yeah. bringing him in to have some talks, chat about some things. We'll be talking some wild card topics as well with him, uh, which will be. Probably COVID related in some regard. Uh, that's my guess. It's a big day for that. Yeah, it's you a big know. day. We, we got we got to share the love. We got to share love. But that's the goal today. So before we get any too further, please subscribe, share with your friends, share it on your socials. Every single share means the world to us. It does not go unnoticed. We still are inundated with good comments, bad comments, but the fact that we get people talking is a good thing. And that's so. all we wanted. So, anyways, that was a terrible spiel, but we're here for it. We're grateful, and uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's an odd day, uh, I would say. I was even talking to, you know, uh, some of my friends who aren't vaccinated. Oh, and uh, I was like, how does it feel that you'll be able to go to this a is restaurant? Time to shine, dog. <laughs> yeah, in a week's time, flourish. Uh, you'll be able to start going to restaurants in about a month. So I'm like, what are your thoughts? And there's like, uh, like it was kind of almost a similar response across all. We're just like. I'm so used to not going to places anymore. I don't really care. Yeah, they're probably saving a bunch of money anyway. <laughs> True. They're probably really saving are. a ton of money. Yeah, real talk. So it's, uh, it's intriguing. I was like, you know, it's kind of here. Like they weren't like, oh, finally, you know, um, especially those who are unvaccinated. You know, a lot of them have the same mentality. It was like, it wasn't there as a takeaway for me in the first place. I don't give a crap. Yeah. You know, um, so I was like, yeah, I understand that too. I totally expected this moment to be maybe more chill. Like, Maybe more of a celebration or like I thought in my mind I was playing it up to be like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be like invigorated. I'm going to feel all these emotions. And I just was like, Mm. I think these last two years have taken a huge toll on our mental health. Yeah. And sometimes it's tough to feel now. Yeah. You know? So now I'm like, is this another false promise? How is this forever? Like I saw how quick they could one shut everything down and keep it closed for closed. I mean, there was some things open, but you know what I mean? Yeah. A state of emergency for two years. I also watched how quickly a federal government can claim it's an emergency and do whatever they want. I've seen that in the last two years now as well. Mm-hmm. In the last two weeks. So to me, I'm going, is this just for now? Yeah. Is this to make a bunch of people happy Were the truckers too loud and you wanted to quiet them? I don't know, but I'm skeptical, mm-hmm. cautiously optimistic. I think that's a very fair feeling. I, I was feeling very similarly. Um, but the other thing I was I was feeling was reflective, and when I said as I said earlier, is what went through my mind is, you know, say everything does go forward, everything's good, we don't end up reverting back to what we were doing. Yeah, you full know, steam ahead. Yeah, we finally can actually put this in our rear view mirror. You know. What really hit me the hardest was the relationships that people have lost forever over something that was temporary. <laughs> Dog, there's people I don't talk to anymore. Dude, that like that's like that's where that was my reflection. For multiple piece. reasons. Yeah, not just pandemic but I'm related. I'm sure the anxiety and fear and uncertainty during a pandemic created both parties, myself and them, mm-hmm. to become more emotional, more sensitive, more hot headed more irrational. If this had been normal times, I don't think I would have been this type of person that would let things go so quickly. But Mm. um, there's just been so much where it's, you have to protect your peace or you don't. And I'd rather protect my peace. Right. And it sucks because I'll never know where those would have went. Yeah. It's a good, good thing. It's a good point you make. And that's where, like, that's where my thoughts went where I'm like, you know, I was lucky enough to not lose any relationships through this. Yeah. But I was very close at points. Yeah. Uh, I could have allowed my emotions to conquer. Yeah. Um, I had to keep that in mind. That was the only thing that kept me sane for most of the pandemic was just, this is going to end at some point, and I'm going to feel like an idiot if I decide to cut someone off because I dislike how they view things. Right. And that's the one thing I never did. I can mm-hmm. sleep well knowing that. Yeah. But there are so many people that both of us know yeah. who have just – Cut ties. Yeah. Uh, like not with, specifically with us. No, but no, just in no, general. No, yeah, like with, just in general. Uh, with We've their seen friends. It. Exactly. Yeah, seen yeah. It. yeah. And I just look at them and I'm like, I remember twenty nineteen. They were best friends. They were doing everything or at least civil or yeah. whatever. And then it was just 
this is the really jarring part. March 2020, we were all concerned about our health. Yeah. Somewhere before the end of 2020, we all chose a political point of view on a health issue. Yeah. I don't know if the government did a really good job at disguising the fact that they were making us pick sides or if as humans we want to find a group of people we feel comfortable with so we're drawn to people that think the same way. I don't know. But there's a lot of side picking. And if you leave that side or start to agree with the other side, the side you were comfortable with will exile you. What the heck, dog? Yeah. Like, no one can think different than you? Yeah. You're not allowed to think different now. No, you're not. You, oh, you're allowed, but it's going to make your life so much harder. Mm -hmm. You know, people will talk about you. Um, see what X, I want to see what they said. You people know? are catty. People or, are petty. Oh, or did you say what they didn't say? <laughs> right. You know, uh, you know, I go, I think through the pandemic and there's so much that we've gone through. Yeah. Go that on. is such a good point. What, what did they, what they, what was it that they didn't say? Yeah. And there was this whole thing during the pandemic that was remaining neutral is the same as siding with the bad thing. Mm -hmm. Not what? If I don't want to say something, I don't want to say something. Mm -hmm. Who are you to make me decide when I'm ready to talk about something? Okay. You don't know what I'm thinking through mm -hmm. the logical, like logic gates that I'm using in my head yeah. of whether, whether or not I should take a certain side or who are you to decide when I'm ready to do that this year or the last two years, it's been like, this is the standard that we've arbitrarily set because we are the louder side. And if you don't keep up, we're exiling you. Yeah, it was a, uh, it reminds me back to the TikTok or, you know, they had that one that I did post about, you know, choosing not to exile relations or, you know, cut yeah. off relations with people yeah. based on politics. Um, and I did make a mention of a cold civil war because of social media. A lot yeah. of people were very uncomfortable with that statement. And I can understand because there's also connotations that go with something saying something like that. Sure. And I chose those words for a specific reason was to, because that's what I'm seeing. We are in a cold civil war. Right. You can't tell me that um, in the States and here that politicians are are using laws to persecute their political opponents. Yeah. That is not good. That is the definition of a cold civil war that can move into a hot civil war at some point. You know, I'm seeing it on both sides. I'm not a huge fan of um, DeSantis down in Florida. Sure. Yep. Saying some, you know, saying you will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law if you have a, a mask mandate in your store. Well, that's not the yeah, freedom. I don't agree with that either. Yeah. I own the business. Yeah, but that's that's the point of what I'm saying is like you are drawing lines by making those types of laws. By yeah. using the law against your political opponents, um, that's where things get dicey. Or we can go into the other part in Texas where now they just passed a bill, the, the uh, Republican governor, whatever it was, passed a bill that they will now be going after parents who will allow their kids to yeah. transition. Yeah. Again, uh, essentially call them child abusers. Yeah. You know, which I'm like, I hear you. I, I can understand where that comes from. But again, you're using the law to push your political <laughs> agenda. Yeah. And I can also say to Trudeau here in Canada, you just decide to invoke an emergencies act on people you disagree with because you refuse to talk to them, refuse to understand them, and then you're just like, you know, we gotta, we gotta get them out of here. This is what I'm talking about when I say a cold civil war. Yeah, you see a lot of these politicians using the law when it, you know, is convenient for them to push their agenda, and that's where I, that's the point where I think we're kind of in a spooky spot. So much so that if I were to post, I don't know. I can't even Dog, name if it. you pass, if you post a Canadian flag right now, yeah, I bet you people would say you, that you support the freedom of convoy and that you are a right wing white supremacist, supre white supremacist, most likely. Yeah, you're right. That would happen. I I I have been walking down the street and I've seen a truck go by with waving Canadian flags, which two years ago meant that you were forgot to take your decorations off your car from Canada Day or whatever you like Canada whatever, but now. Simply having the Canadian flag, I, in my heart, believe the left right now would say they're a white supremacist. They're a convoy. The, the typical words that they're using to describe the right right now. Yeah. And I just think about all the things that we've been through as a culture through it all, whether it be the start of the, the George Floyd stuff, 
um, to the Rittenhouse stuff, um, to the indigenous children. Um, Everyone is every, worn out. We are. There's been so much that we've had to endure. There, and, and you know? especially those marginalized communities, mm -hmm. specifically, you know, uh, around George Floyd mm -hmm. and Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. and the indigenous children. Mm -hmm. They have had it bad before the pandemic. I think they had it worse during. Mm. That really, so uh, uh, add the pandemic and then add on coming from or being a member of that community that's just getting ripped apart online for being black. You didn't choose to be black. Yeah, You didn't choose to be indigenous. And these people were getting it every single day on the internet oh. from groups of people. Yeah, you and, know? It, and I even feel for those, um, like because I have... It's going to sound funny, uh, but you know the, the some of the black friends I do have who do identify with conservative values. Yeah, they got it even worse through it all of it because. Oh yeah, you said what? You don't agree with what? You know, you're right. not. You ain't black. Um, right. That, I, they've got that. Yeah, I've had know? friends tell me that because they identified with a more conservative government that. As a black person, their black friends were maybe judging them or, you know, yeah. making assumptions about them. So basically what I'm trying to say is we're all screwed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we might as well just live with our heart on our sleeve at this point. Rather than hide it, why don't we all just start saying what's on our mind? Yeah. I think it's a great idea. Let's just be open. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, and that's literally all I wanted to kind of get at when it comes to this um, situation is just – Take a moment to reflect. You know, um, I had to think about myself. Um, what did what did Josh Udall look like pre-pandemic? Yeah. And what do I look like right now? I'm a very, very different person. Me too. Um, in some cases, more sad. Like, I've, if I were to see myself now, if Josh two years ago saw himself now and seen how cynical I've become mm. um, and just – sad in general by the con you know where the world is at yeah that, that josh would have been bummed out by that you yeah. know and uh you know i'm we've, not gonna we've all lost our sparkle yeah i think it's a good good uh, you know way of putting it i think this last quarter of the pandemic at this point for me i'd say no not even like this is like the last 10 percent of it so since december right is when it was the absolute hardest for me like i was yeah feeling it um yeah definitely it was it was getting to the point of just being very very comfortable with the idea of not existing anymore yeah i was getting i was at that point where i was just like what's the point of living yeah. you know and um like i'm good like i'm just done you know obviously it didn't help obviously you know i think me leaving nova scotia was one of my biggest mistakes because uh, i realized what it could be what my life could be and it wasn't that way um, yeah. and then obviously then getting COVID on top of that, my wife then getting COVID and us being, you know, on lockdown in Nova Scotia, lockdown in Nova Scotia. And then obviously just be, having to be our house for two weeks, essentially. Um, it was just like, and then on top of that, just trying to work through it all and just wake up doing the same thing every day, wake up, go downstairs, do the exercise bike, eat some cereal, go to the laptop work. And it just was the same thing day in day out. And I was just I like losing it. So that's my perspective to those uh, who have maybe had some issues uh, mentally, uh, the mental health problems. Like, again, feel free to reach out. If not to us. To, there's resources. There's so many resources out there. Um, I can definitely identify with how you've been feeling possibly. Um, I've been there. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you this much. If you you know decide that this is not worth living anymore, whoever it is just wins. Because you're an amazing person who has something to offer this world. Rather you think of that or not, you think you do or not, you do. There's somebody you impact. There's somebody that you add a positivity to. Remember that. And that's just come from a stranger on a podcast. But I can guarantee that that's the case. So, yeah. That is a great way to transition. But here we are. We are gonna. We are excited because Chris is actually going to be here anytime now. So we are actually going to take a slight break here and we'll be back with Chris. All right, here we are here with Christopher Stieg, who is awesome, has done a lot. He's accomplished some stuff on the ice. Off the ice, business-wise, entrepreneurship, everything we stand for. Yeah, all things know. we love. And, uh, you know, it's uh, pretty cool. So those who do know him, 
Uh, yeah, he's a two-time Stanley Cup winner with the Chicago Blackhawks, um, but as well has gone on to start a company that's doing very well called Clever. Uh, it is an app, and we'll let him kind of describe more so what that's all about. But thank you for coming on. Thank you for joining yes. us. So thankful. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. No problem. So let's start with kind of the the, uh, the question here is, what is Clever? What's this all about? Like, what inspired you to start an app like this or try to get an app off the ground like this? Yeah, there's there's numerous reasons why it's here today. First off, the, the main reason is I wanted to build an app for like a 10 year old me, someone who couldn't afford much, couldn't afford anything. And obviously with inflation and the way the world's going and how expensive sports are and how exclusive they are, I was like, how can I give back on a mass scale? And technology is the best way to do that. But the re the other reason is parents, especially between the age of eight and 13, kept reaching out to me to look at their kids' clips. And what they'd have to do is send me the clip. And if I look at it, sometimes I'd write it on a piece of paper and take a picture of the paper for the kid to look at it. Or I'd put it on one platform, Coach's Eye or Huddle, then take it off and put it into like Filmora or iMovie, pull it out, create a link. I'm like, why is this process so hard? I'm like, all I need is to take a clip, draw on it, speak to it, and shoot it off like seconds, right? Yeah. So I was like, I started, I reached out to tons of coaches, even my co-founders, over a hundred parents as well. And they kept saying like, we have the same issue, right? Uh, When we're filming, we have so much video. And and when we send it to a coach, we have to send big files and the coaches don't want it. So I'm like, well, why can't we streamline the film for the parent and also give the coach the ability to quickly annotate and share. So that's what we've done is clip edit and share a year ago to me was like the worst worst three words in the world because in order to clip edit and share it would take an hour now i can do literally 36 shot annotations in under an hour so if i have 36 kids send me a shot i could just pull it in hey look at here do 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 draw it up boom shoot it off pull up another one boom, do, do, shoot it off so that's what we've done is we've streamlined the entire process of clip edit and share and uh yeah we just launched december 15th was our official day we launched we're beta technically um, cause we're still testing and building and everything we're doing. Um, and we're starting to get some users and we're starting to get organizations. But the biggest piece is, is we got a couple of cool features coming out. Things that have never been, well, the one thing that I've never seen anywhere before is digital whiteboards for sports. Um, just the ability to tap record and hockey whiteboard pop up and you can talk over it and draw over it and then send it off. So m- more like a movie whiteboard kind of thing. And you can attach it to clips and stuff like that. And just again, I wanted to give it to a youth market. I wanted to build this app for the youth market. I didn't want to build it for pros or for, you know, a coaches is what we call them. I wanted to build it for the youth market to be coach, even though we have pros and NHL guys starting to use it now, but I wanted to build a free app and give something to the kids, kids that can't afford it. And kids that could have, and parents that now have the ability to use technology like the pros do. So that's a long winded answer of saying everything I wanted to do it's starting to happen again if it works it works if it doesn't it doesn't i'm going to try my best in order to get this to as many people as possible and see if they like it i'm actually wow yeah i was just going to say what a what a inspiring thing to do or like things i could dream of doing one day or it's such a i think a dream for anyone who you know maybe becomes uh an entrepreneur is is to have a mission have something that's the why um i think that's super super cool and uh so humble of you i think it's incredible to see um my some of my background is software development so i'm really curious of yeah. what challenges were faced during app development and how you you know built that team of of developers or source of what was that like for you it's continuously you know app development is continuous right you find bugs you find issues you have to build a feature you got to test the feature And then you got to retest all your other features. You got to retest all the tech to make sure it's up to date because every time you do merges, there's other issues that come with the technology, right? So uh, I I listened, I read that, was it the Lean Startup? Oh, yes. Uh, I did an audio book and they're always like, you're going to build, you're going to test, you're going to learn, you're going to build, you're going to test, you're going to learn. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm building, I'm testing, I'm learning. (laughs) And that's kind of how it was. So uh, there was a, there was an idea phase. There was a bit of a discovery phase. And then it was like, I need to build the product. I need you like programmers, man. You guys do magic, literally do magic. And so I reached out to uh, MNP. They have like a, a firm where I could contract a guy. So I started to contract this guy who started the contract for us. 
And I realized I'm like, this is so expensive though, right? Mm. Contracting. Yeah. So I'm like, why don't I just bring him on full time? And that's what we did is we brought him over. He's our full time CTO. Nice. And as we started to build, we brought on a guy named Mood. He's a junior developer. He helps with more of the front end development, right? Yeah. And then uh, and then Steve is obviously doing like a lot of the camera work in the back end. And then we actually I sent out an uh, Instagram probably three months ago. And we got really lucky. Some kid's brother's a developer. He doesn't have a science degree, but he's high end. Like he works with like the metal basically, right? Yeah. And he's the guy who's redeveloped our coach mode. And he's the guy who's developed the, the whiteboards. And it is lightning fast now. Like you can pull up two clips literally side by side. You can toggle them at the same time. You can sync them up, move them together. And this is a feature coming out next week. And again, it's just like, you just see the level of talent they have and what they're doing. But again, it's trying to make sure they all have what they're good at and push them into that right lane. Yeah. I'm still new at this. I don't, I don't fully, I think I even grasp what they can do. Cause like I look at it and it's like, there's just <laughs> ones and zeros and crazy stuff. Here, but <laughs> for me, it, it's like, uh, it's been a real humbling experience. Uh, it's been a great experience. Uh, and I've got to meet a lot of really, really cool people. And I'm just hoping that, again, that I can keep, you know, you, you want to keep employing more people, keep helping more people, keep finding more developers, uh, guys that want to help uh, change the world and, and work together. And I've got a great team and uh, they're awesome, man. It, it is really, it is, again, back to the technology piece. I had a vision. We're like, how do we, uh, are we at a pain point? How do you solve that pain point? How do you come up with a feature that solves that pain point? You bring that feature to the developer, they build the feature, you test it with the market, you see if they like it, and then you start to see what else they want, right? So that's, again, from the development standpoint, from the software, test, build a feature, see if it works, whatever. And again, you might have entrepreneurs listening to this and be like, Christopher Stieg's an idiot, right? Like, that's not how you do it. But that's just how I do it. I mean, I've never been, I never took an entrepreneurial class. I never done any of that. I'm just kind of winging it in the sense of, at the start now we have a little more science behind us data trying to drive like how we do this but at the start it just came from again just trying to help kids i didn't even know what a startup was I swear to god a year and a half ago i didn't even know what scale was i thought scale nice. was something you stand on <laughs> right? now you hear people like how are you going to scale the company i'm like holy hell like scale and monetize i'm like what is monetize before right <laughs> yeah. like you know so it's just like once you get into this world, you hear these things and there's way overused words. It's crazy. But yeah. at the end of the day, back to the development of the app, um, real cool stuff. And it's a lot of testing, recycling. This doesn't work. This is a bug, this, this, and then you move on. Absolutely. And I will say as someone who's been a UX designer for seven years now, what you're doing is actually correct. I love everything you're doing. It makes sense. You're testing it with your audience. That's exactly what you should be doing. So you're well, definitely on the right track. The UX, the UX is obviously the biggest part too, mm -hmm. right? You can build the feature, but if the person doesn't understand the experience of it, right? And the UI, like it won't work. Yep. And if it's not easy and if there's any friction, they don't care to pick it up. So I would actually love you to pick it up and tell me. You know, your feedback, if you ever pick up my app, be like, hey, Chris, this is stupid. Why is this button here? Why? And I'll, you know, if you ever have that, like your minds are incredible, man. You're like, man, imagine if this button was here or this plus sign was here, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. Like the UX, it's crazy. Like I, again, I didn't know there was a difference between a program or UI, UX, anything before. Right. I thought it was like, oh, you guys do everything, you know? <laughs> so um, designer, whatever. It, it's cool though. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate that. And I mean, for someone who's kind of has jumped in, like even going from, you know, uh, the sports world moving into the business world, there's obviously such a steep learning curve there, but you seem to be picking it up very well um, just by the success you're already having with the product. I know you said earlier um, how you'd kind of annotate in the app. Um, are you are you annotating kind of on like the mobile device or are you trying to are you annotating on a desktop? No, so we got, we didn't even want the desktop. So what we found is most kids like to learn from their phone. Right. It's like high usage. Most kids don't want to go desktop. Coaches still like to teach desktop. So we will have a desktop version, but again, you got to pick like, we obviously have to build on the Apple device first, right? You can't just build on both because we're built natively. And that's yeah. the thing we, we need to understand like, you know, what, what's going to make the Apple product great. So then now we can go out and build the Android. And, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I don't even know where I was going with this answer, but that, that's basically that. 
Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. I was I was mainly uh, again. This is just where my mind's been going. Is I was just curious of the use case for like the coaches or yourself when you're trying to give feedback to to youth. Obviously, like the oh, end user. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So like the drawing and the annotation. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So are you are you saying sorry like when you draw on it and like yeah what, so what is real? yeah exactly for you as a coach when you're trying to give feedback back to like the the end user here which would be the yeah. you know the the player what would that like annotation um, flow look like? or a feel yeah so basically this is again clip edit and share so mm -hmm. when we were talking like the desktop the desktop was so clunky and they just didn't yeah. work out the way we wanted it to and most of the kids learn from the phone sorry my my brain was going a million miles a minute that's all good but they mostly learn from the phone mm -hmm. so we mm -hmm. wanted to build the first app on the phone because again we just wanted the coach to be able to take a clip or the parent on the phone send it to a coach or a parent or generally a coach on the phone because that's the connection the parent to the coach the coach to be able to pull it up put it in coach mode hit record draw over the clip talk over the clip you can even add you can do frame to frame forward frame to frame back you could scrub and hit slow-mo and then hit stop on the recording and hit save and boom it's saved like that and you can send that clip right off back right so that's the clip edit annotate whatever you want to say and share and that process before was, you know, take a clip on your camera, put it onto the desktop, put it onto huddle, take it out of huddle, you know? And I'm like, to put it on desktop is too slow. I'm like, I want instant coaching. Cause we did again, study e-learning. We looked at instant or visual retention. And if you can get something to a kid instantly, 60% higher, 30 to 60% higher visual retention rate or the, the retention rate is uh, higher if you can give it to him right away. And that's the thing we kept looking at is kids love their phone, right? And they're always on their phone. And we looked at other companies that looked at doing desktop or other things. And they said, they, the kids won't go desktop. They just want to look at their phone, right? Now we may need to have a desktop version at some point for the coach. We do have iPad version and okay. the iPad's great, right? That makes a lot of so, sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're also not like a housing place, like Instat or these companies that house you know, thousands of clips. You can pull our uh, Instat clips up into Clever. You can talk over them and share them real quickly. I, I don't want our app to be an analytical platform. We're not like, we're not, we're not a direct on competitor of Huddle in that sense. Right. Or Instat because they're j basically like, you know, you take all the kids shifts, you break it down, you give ice time, you give all this. And I'm like, that's not what I want us to do. You know, I want us to basically focus more on the individual athlete within that. Right. So you can take that clip. You can also look for third party coaching, but more focus our company on instant coaching, not on, um, you know, instant takes 24 to 72 hours later to get your video huddle as well. Right. So right. I wanted yeah. us to have the ability to do it. And even with our share option in our camera, you tap share, you tap a group. If you're a manager and a coach, you take a clip, it's shot right to the coach. Now coaches have the ability on the bench to look at a clip, right? right. So that's what we focus on rather than huddle in those other companies. Um, so yeah, that, that's basically uh, us in a nutshell and what we, we think we're about. Absolutely, that makes sense. Uh, what was it like for you? I'm just curious, I, this is the question I really am interested in. I'm sorry, I'm just stealing it from you, Dalton. That's okay. Uh, is what was it like for you in making that the, the shift and the change from yeah. sp like competitive sport, from being a professional athlete to the business world? Do you, did you kind of encounter at any point people, uh, it was a challenge for people to take you seriously at all? Um, or was it people took, gave you a lot of respect when you came over? Uh, what was that kind of transition like uh, for you? Yeah, so my brother's kind of the business guy. He's the one okay. with the MBA, he's a banker. He's the one I've really relied on to when we were in the meetings, especially early on. I'm like, what is a business model? What is a revenue? You know what I mean? Right. And and so those meetings early on, yeah, I feel like they were in meetings with me, maybe just because of who I was at the time. Mm. I don't know if they really took me seriously, nor should they, I guess, at the time, because I didn't really know much about it. But I really had to rely on my brother to really just dumb it right down for me. Hey, this is what this is. Um, maybe learn about this. So I look back on to the, uh, and I still do it every day. I call them like, what is this? Or what are we doing here? Or, what's going on here? But early on, especially me and Josh, Josh is a coach of the Kelowna Rockets. He's a co-founder of Clever. And my other brother, Mitch, he's still playing pro. Nice. Uh, we really had to rely on my one brother, the one with the NBA to really understand business, business, you know, lingo, whatever they're saying. Um, 
and just so we could start to join the conversation. You know what I mean? Like there's sometimes like, I'm sure just someone off the street, they come into hockey and then they don't really get the fine details of hockey early on. Like I could be talking about a fine detail, but once I start to talk with you about, you can start to look at it and understand those fine details, right? Right. So that's kind of where I was in business, but I had to rely on someone to give me those fine details. And that was my brother. That makes a lot of sense. I love that. I'm uh, thinking now, uh, as you've mentioned a couple, I guess we'll call them buzzwords, which is revenue model, your monetization, things like that. Um, previously, you said that this app is is your way of giving back and, and for the children who maybe, you know, can't afford the, the biggest, best tools. And even on the app store, I looked and the app is free. So I'm curious, what is your pricing model or your approach to monetization? Is it a subscription? Is there going to be two versions? How are you approaching those next steps of the app? Yeah, you could kind of think of it as like a LinkedIn model. Like we're always going to have our free version and it's going to be a base model. Our next and, and the current features we're going to be releasing will most likely be in our second model, which will be an upgraded model. Think of like a LinkedIn premium, yep. be like a club premium. Yep. So you'll get like better coaching features. Uh, the coaches that do end up paying into this, they'll be higher in our algorithm. We'll also uh, feature them more. Uh, we'll spotlight them, whether we'll give them verification badges, a oh. lot of things like that. So it'll be more of that type of model. And we're also going to start to create a marketplace within it where you can reach out to third party coaches. Yeah. So you're going to, it's going to be a marketplace. If you almost think of like, if you're a parent and you want to look out for third party coaching, you could reach out, Hey, Chris Steve, could you look at my shot? Uh, I could charge you $50 to look at your shot. And then obviously clever could take a piece off the bottom in between the two parties. So ah. there's new, there's two streams of monetization we're really looking at, but the first one we're going to go with will be that, that type of LinkedIn model. If you're looking for yeah. like clever and a clever premium. Got it. That's a, I think a brilliant way. Um, and so, will, it, it, would that always be the coaches is the incentive for the coaches to buy in and not the kids, right? Well, that, I think that's that. And also maybe the parents as well, right? Ah. Like if you think of the coach and the parent being more of the connection. Yep. Um, Fair. No one's, I guess, I mean, I talk to a lot of people. They're like, no one's ever figured out the youth sport market, right? It's a really fragmented market. And yep. how do you figure it out? I don't know if we will. Who knows? It's it's uh, what we're going to try to do. Yep. Um, again, if it works out, it works out. If not, you pivot and you try something else. But for me... Uh, that makes the most sense for what we're going to do is, you know, make this base model free, yep. give the coaches more features. We got some real wicked whiteboard features that will be coming out that we've talked with coaches that they would love um, in the future. And then obviously we still need to build our Android. That's the other thing. But monetization, those are the two real ways. Nice. And so I'm, it's funny as you're talking, I can, I can even hear it in your tone uh, and how you're, how you're talking about things. It seems like you've really, Obviously, when you play professional sports and then you also win twice at the top level of said sport, uh, you obviously have a, a specific uh, competitivity and tenacity about you. Uh, do you feel like you've been able to bring that into the business world and really try to make this the best product it can possibly be? Yeah, I think tenacity was always near my name, uh, mm. right next to it. It depends, you know, <laughs> and that's kind of how I played. Um, yeah, I mean you it is also different right like in hockey you're all jacked up and you also almost become a different person mm. i think i'm just trying to be myself in in a leadership role in business right now in my company i also know um i can't do everything and i have a lot of weaknesses especially in here and i need to be surrounded by good people and if i can't do it who else can do this to help this company get bigger who, help the, who can make this company better and who can get this yeah. product out to more people. So uh, I think there's there's a little bit of humbleness in the sense that I know I can take it to a certain point. I don't think I can take it past a certain point, but what can I do in order to get it to a place where, you know, Clever's in a really good place? And I think it's going to be my tenacity as a person and as a leader to get it there. Uh, again, I'm not in a boardroom screaming at anyone or, <laughs> or in my meetings. It's more, oh, maybe my brother one time. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, like, I think it's just more about, you know, relentless and trying to get it into people's hands, show them the product and show them that it'll work. Cause yeah, like I really try to work between, you know, nine and three every day. And again, I come on with people at night, the odd time after I get the kids down. So I think it's just the tenacity to make sure that I'm pushing this forward. 
and get it to a place to where maybe one day I can't take it anymore and it's too, you know, it, it's too big for me or that'd be the ideal situation if it is. Um, but also again, knowing like there's a lot of people that know a hell of a lot more than me in this situation and really try to rely on them to get me there. So think of it as a cerebral way too, not just like, yeah. I'm just going to do this. Right. That is spoken like a true entrepreneur is, is knowing there's sometimes people better at something than you. And, and, there's a lot of people better and, at me. And, and, and putting those people in your business for the betterment and you speak with such passion, you know, it's, it is, it's truly cool to hear like, you know, from an entrepreneur like that. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, uh, I think back to, you know, I, I'm just, this is more of an aside, uh, you know, I grew up a huge Flames fan, you know, loved having you play with us for a few years there, and, uh, but also really disliked you uh, back in 2010 mainly, uh, because you guys really caused my boys a lot of trouble uh, in those days. Uh, so you yourself really upset me a lot. Just want to let you know um, yeah. as a player. But, you know, I'm sure you get that a lot. Uh, so anyways, um, what was it like, though? Um, kind of, I guess, wh uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, do, you, do you value kind of what's been like? Uh, I'm trying to figure out the best way to word this. Obviously, you had your, your playing career. Then you're also you're kind of in the business now. Are, is there one part of that, like, is there one life that you prefer over the other? Or are they, are they both awesome in different ways? You know what I love is coaching my kids. Mm. Like, right oh. now. like it, it's, it's the closest thing that gives me that, like, uh, fuel, I guess. All right. The company, Clever, gives me passion and it gives me purpose. Coaching my kids gives me... Um, I don't even know what to say, like the energy, like mm -hmm. you're jacked up on the bench again, you're on the bench, you're screaming, you're like, come on guys, let's go. You're in there giving pump up speeches and you're seeing kids grow and you're, you're seeing them get better. And it's just an unbelievable feeling. Again, I said to my wife, besides COVID and all the crap going on here, this has been such an incredible year. Just when, when we were allowed to, to coach my kids now. I miss big moments. Mm. I miss playing the Calgary Flames <laughs> 2009 playoffs yeah. when we were supposed to lose. Oh, you know? Yeah. You guys were so good. You were the, the favorites. We ended up going on to Vancouver the next year. I miss playing at home as a rookie against Calgary. I miss playing that next series against Vancouver. I miss that feeling just, you know, being a young athlete in the prime playing in the biggest moments with the biggest spotlight going on to Stanley Cup finals. Those are the things I miss. I would rather be in those moments the rest of my life. Mm. Um, just because again, there's just no adrenaline that can get you to that, that type of feeling. I mean, there right. really isn't. I, I, I'm sure you could go on and sell companies or, or, you know, do great things, but there's nothing I don't know that could ever make me feel that type of energy again, mm -hmm. you know, unless maybe my kids, you know, go on to be, you know, maybe they go graduate or something. Maybe that's the next time you feel that mm -hmm. right. my kids are born, but like, I'm more so talking on a personal selfish level, right? Yeah. Like for myself. So I don't know. I don't know what that, that best case scenario or what life I prefer, but I do miss the big moment more than for sure. Anything. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, it reminds me actually of something Sean Payton, you know, the ex uh, head coach for the New Orleans yeah. Saints, right? Uh, he, I remember catching an interview of his, and he was the kind of talking to a group of boys, high school football boys, and uh, he was saying, you know, Friday night football. There's something about it growing up playing high school Friday night football, and you know, you'll get this feeling every Friday night you get to play, but you won't come. It won't come every Friday night, but you'll get it again after you graduate. It'll come when your kid is born, the day you're married. Uh, they won't be as, it won't be every Friday night, but they will come at just at various points. And I kind of, that's kind of what I understand what you just said there. There's just, there's points that things come. Yeah. Obviously there, there, you know, you had points in your life that were a lot of fun. Obviously, you know, being able to play in front of 18,000 screaming fans in the playoffs. I can only imagine what that's like, yeah. da, 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 da. no, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, I can imagine how that would feel. So I get it. Um, I guess living life, being in business, and then as well as just being able to see your kids grow up, I can only imagine that must be just a very different feeling, but also rewarding in different ways, for sure. Yeah, exactly. And kind of back to the kids grow and into their hockey, um, the adrenaline on the bench, the, again, the biggest thing is just seeing them uh, get better every day. So that that's maybe where I'm saying, like, I miss that adrenaline. Mm. Yeah. Um, maybe that's that's a way of saying it. 
because you know being on the ice again and just feeling the feeling of a loss like when my kids lose they're six years old but you know they play a hockey game and they they lose and you're like oh i feel bad for them right and then they win and you feel this like oh i kind of feel it again you know Mm -hmm. i'm I'm really happy they won but they're six (laughs) right (laughs) (laughs) it's like it it kind of gives you that little bit of energy again absolutely yeah i think you know i can look back on those memories too growing up playing sports and the one thing that i can relate to that maybe your kids can is having that maybe taken from them due to covid and the situation that we're in right now what has that been like as one their coach but mainly as their parent um trying to navigate this while still keeping them energized and wanting to continue to play sports because as easy it is to fall in love with sports sometimes it can be as easy to fall out of love with them and a pandemic that's mentally draining can do that so what's that been like it's been horrible it's been horrible especially for the young athlete I would not know where I would be today if they took sports from me when I was 14 to 16 or yeah. when I was 10 to 12. Um, again, I I didn't have much as a kid. My grandma basically said she kept funding us in order to keep me and my brothers out of jail. And that's basically what she said. So again, you take me out of sports when I'm 10, 11, 12, I'm very vulnerable and we're in a in a tough situation. What do we do with our time? What do we do with our extra time? Yeah. It's been really difficult. Uh, you know, I talked to 10 year olds, talk to 11 year olds, you know, and they're mentally struggling, mentally struggling. And I'm not talking like they're just sad or depressed. It's really bad. Right. Yeah. And I look across the States. I have friends in Chicago, friends in Florida, friends in even Alberta and Alberta's found a way to even play more hockey in BC than Ontario. Yeah. And they've in, and in Europe, they've, they've kept kept kids in school, but they've kept them active the entire time. Yeah, right. Ontario has been disgusting. They've shut kids down time and time again. I understood it at the start, right? Sure. I understood they haven't found a way again, like they just locked us down three weeks ago for the previous six weeks prior to that. Like, you have had kids that are 12, 14, 16, who put two to six hours, depending on the day, two to six hours a day of their time every single day. And they've played 40 serious hockey games in two years. You look at the kids in the States, they play 40 in four months. They Mm. play 80 in a season, 72 games in Minnesota, my friend. What are we doing to our kids here in Ontario, especially and in Canada, where we keep taking them out of sport? And what you just touched on is sport kids, kids in sport quit. The average age in hockey is 12, okay? Um, I don't know if this is true numbers. Fact checkers fact check me all day. I do know this, 600,000 kids registered for Hockey Canada in 2019. This past year, it was like 380,000. And I don't know if it was 380 or 390,000. There's numerous reasons for that. Number one, kids usually quit at 12. They quit at 10 now, right? So the kid that was gonna quit at 12, he's now quit at 10. So that that prolonged career has now been cut short because they were going to quit anyways but again then at the end of the day those two years were still prime years of learning about team sport yeah. making friends staying active a lot of real important things number two hockey canada um they're losing a lot of players due to renegade leagues and stuff like that and then number three a lot of parents were scared of covid because of what's gone on they're scared to put them back in sport so there's numerous factors going into that number But the biggest thing again is kids quitting at a young age. So how do we prolong that, that life again of getting, first off, we need kids back in sport. Like it it is a, it is the lifeblood of like basically every single country, soccer, golf, baseball, soccer, it doesn't matter what the sport is. So how do we get kids back into sport and how do we get that average age back up to 12 or how do we get kids playing longer than 12 so they can stay active longer? Because we look at we look at covid we look at the issues the reason for severe covid we look at all the comorbidities everything that comes with it whether it be you know vitamin d deficiency and other things and we still don't talk about making sure kids are healthy in canada we don't talk about them being active and i agree there is it can be a bad thing right covid can be a bad thing and treat different people differently but the number one thing you can do is take care of yourself physically is number one right and we do not talk about them and it to me it is that is the most heartbreaking thing and to see my kids go through it and they get they get all excited about hockey for two weeks and then they get shut down and then they go to school and then they get shut down 
and it's like on and off and on and off and it's like uncle they've been doing they've been kids have been playing right through in europe since basically they shut down in march for one month in europe in the states they've kept playing so these canadian kids have suffered and i feel sick for them and they better not shut them down again right yeah that's kind of what i gathered um obviously you know, Nova Scotia has done their own thing here, um, you know, but I've, I have my sister lives in Toronto and kind of seeing again, as you said, the on and off, off again, I can only imagine how that would be. It's already been taxing enough on me as, you know, 29 year old male. <laughs> yeah, imagine. Uh, I'm I, 10. Yeah, when you're formative years, right? Um, well, me too, though. Me too, as yeah. a parent, like mentally, I, I'm, I would be lying to you to say I'm just great all the time. Yeah. Right. You know, like I struggle too, mm-hmm. like, right? Yep. And like we all struggle right now. And that's, it's a crisis. It is a mental yeah. health is a crisis right now and trying to find people to talk to, trying to find people to help. Uh, a lot of the time there's just, there's just not enough people to help in this situation right now. And I know 10 people in the last two years, OD and suicide, right? All between the age of 20 and 40. Dang. So some are parents. Well, most of them are parents or have kids mm-hmm. and that's the issue, right? You have these people who are active too and they may have mental illness or they may have issues and then they don't become active they get the gym taken away from them they get life taken away from them they get you know going out with friends and then all of a sudden you stuff them in a basement right right then they come out of the basement well you're going back in the basement right it's just been it's been a hard process for everyone and finally like i was like i'm not saying anything i'm not saying anything And then finally that last lockout happened and I saw the effect and I saw all these people that I've known have passed away, especially one of my friends, Josh Weiss, rest in peace. I was like, screw this. I'm saying stuff now. Like I, I, again, I respect everyone. I respect whatever anyone wants to do, but I'm starting to fight for the kids and the people who can't speak, especially the people with mental health and my, my children and their friends. So whether people believe what I say or not, or say he's a kooky guy or conspiracy, whatever, I don't talk about conspiracy. I just talk about the mental health and trying to make sure kids are out and active. And that's my main goal. Um, that's something I really appreciate about yeah. you. Um, that you, that's the letter what got my attention. Uh, when I, you know, obviously followed you, you know, your career, but then obviously you kind of retired, retired back in 2020. I think it was, uh, then you kind of popped up on my TikTok, and it was kind of, it was, it was obviously kind of a hilarious video, um, of the most Canadian interaction I've ever seen. And two guys are like, Hey, do I know you from somewhere? <laughs> and yeah. you're just like, yeah, in a former life, I was Chris Versteeg. Um, and, uh, I thought that was hilarious. Uh, and then that's what kind of caught my attention. Like, Oh, Chris Versteeg's at one of these, uh, you know, these, uh, convoy protests and, you know, I'd love to kind of hear his perspective and kind of hear where, where you've come from on this. It's like you, you've you lost life in your life directly. You know, people have suffered. Um, yeah. I can see why you've had enough. And I am right there with you. I totally agree. Yeah, that, that and the convoy protests, um, man, it was an incredible experience. Mm. Uh, all walks of life. I've talked to every age, every ethnicity, every political background. And whether people want to believe what I'm saying or not, I don't care. I was there. Yeah. There was tons of people there and there was nothing but high fives and people hugging and just saying, I'm with you. And man, it was an amazing, uh, day. Even those Canadian dudes, man, that's still one of the funniest things. Like, <laughs> you, you know, I'm just the way they said it. It was like the most Canadian accents ever. Oh, definitely. Um, they were crying. Mm. The one guy was crying after that video. Like when he was gave that little speech after I posted, I don't know if I posted on TikTok or Instagram. Yeah. And he was talking to the truckers. He's a father. And he was talking about what he, t- he was telling me about what his kids have been through. And now I, I pulled up the Instagram live and then he gave a speech and he just started breaking down because of everything he's been through. And so that, that uh, day was an amazing day for me. I'm proud to be a part of it. And, and I won't apologize to anybody for being a part of it. Good. And good for you. I love that. Mm-hmm. Live unapologetically. Yeah. Yeah. We're here for that. You got anything else you want to say? The, not on that front. I think, do you have something loaded up? Yeah. Just, yeah. Yep. Just go ahead. On. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, before, as we, you know, before we end off here, um, I think what has like, you know, obviously things are starting to be lifted in Ontario. It's apparently March 1st, uh, Nova Scotia, yeah. it's March 21st. Um, they're uh, lifting all the restrictions. Um, but I've been obviously following your Instagram and, you know, you haven't had the most flattering things to say about Mr. Trudeau and, uh, also your local MPs for good reason. Um, what do you think happens from here? (laughs) It's been divisive. Mm -hmm. Like it has been 
disgustingly divisive. And I seen that other MP the other day saying honk honk means you're a Nazi. And how do you get away with that? Right. How do you get away speaking like that as a representative of a county? That is horrendous. Mm -hmm. That is hate. That is pure hate and is divisiveness. And they're acting like they're, and again, I'm not, I'm partisan, man. I don't care. I don't, I don't like the conservatives last election. I don't like the liberals. I don't like the NDPs. I don't like any of them. Yeah. I don't like any of them. I'm not political. Mm -hmm. They're all in there for their own reasons. I even still look at the conservatives. They're all in there because they saw the political jockeying of what happened with the truckers. And then, you know, O'Toole was a complete joke, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but let's not even get into that. But you start to look at the divisiveness and where do we come from here? Yeah. What do we do? You look at the narratives from either side and it, it, it's all about identity politics now. It's not about telling the news and letting someone critically think through a situation. It's about telling you one piece and how to think. And it doesn't matter what side it comes from, right? Yeah. Yeah. How do you go about it though, is I think you still gotta try to find ways to listen to both sides, to critically think through situations. That's what university used to be for. I hope it can still be about that. I know university has gone one way and, and really and pushing narratives, which whatever. But for me, it's like, listen to both sides listen to both arguments um understand that and and prior to this like i mean i'm very um i i would see myself as a very liberal person like mm -hmm. in the sense of like i i love everyone i don't care what you do who you are color of your skin who you want to love anything right and how do we get back to that is not having the speech of these mps right not having these people continually go out and try to divide everyone and it is from now on that's where i just said like i don't ever want to talk politics again when this is done yeah. i never wanted to ever talk politics but i'm like i understand the players playing they can't say anything mm. they'll have to reply like they, they'll just they'll be done right yeah. Play, uh, like players playing can't get into politics i could get that but for me it was just finally i, I just saw what was happening and how do you fix this back to the entire thing about MPs like Turdball, like this guy, Tur Turnball, sorry, Ryan Turnball. <laughs> uh, like he's my MP, he hasn't picked up my call. They don't answer my email. The email's turned off, even though it's in his contact list. So mm -hmm. how do you get a hold of these people to even talk to them to tell them your, your issues? So um, there's, a, there's a massive amount of issues, but where it comes from is, I think it just comes from um, holding MPs accountable for their, their speech and, and and whether it be Trudeau being the worst of the worst for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, all of them continually pushing uh, hate and divisiveness. I mean, you heard Bill Maher even come out, a very liberal uh, Democrat. Yeah. And he called out uh, Trudeau for what he was saying. Like, that, what he said was disgusting. Yeah. He was just promoting people to hate each other. Um, that's not a leader. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not someone that I would want to follow is someone trying to get me to hate an average or not an average, like a, a regular human being. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that's where I go. Well, again, I don't care who anyone votes for. I don't care about any of that. I just care about people being held accountable. Like that lady who's saying Hong Kong is for Nazis. Yeah. Like, I, like how does she not be reprimanded? Yeah. in the cabinet for saying that she should never be allowed to speak in the cabinet again for saying something like that like that's how they should be reprimanded if you're going to promote divisiveness you're not allowed to speak in the cabinet again mm. you have to find a p to be represented or, or how else is it going to happen i don't know i don't mm. know enough about politics to even say that that can happen right um and then where this finishes i always want to say is they need to find a way to get money into youth sports again at the end of this they've killed youth sports They've stopped it uh, in schools. They don't allow schools to have sports, uh, extracurriculars, all that. They need to push money into youth sports, get kids active again, and start promoting the healthy lifestyles that they need. For sure. And we are right yeah. there with you. You're preaching to the choir on that one. Yeah. yeah. And, like, yeah absolutely. That's all we've talked about for like, and it's just like, no, I feel like you never heard or you're like you said, called a conspiracy theorist. So you're called this, you're called that. When all we're really asking for is to just hear your neighbor out, hear your colleague out, hear your friend out. Maybe they're, maybe you think they're crazy, but hear them out. Yeah. Yeah. I've just never understood like where we've gone with, um, even 
you go about the entire situation over the last two years, like why would you ever want someone to die based on whatever their decision is? Yeah. Right. There's been so much of that. And, and even from politicians, they'll say that like, Oh, this person didn't want to do this and they died. That's their fault. Uh, they deserve it. Or, you know what I mean? It's just like, where in your heart could you ever say that about someone? Like where in your soul would you yeah. ever even want to imply these things on based on whatever their decision is to, and even that goes for the other side, you know, if someone, if someone decides to get the V or whatever, and something happens or whatever, it's like, well, that person did it. That's their fault. That's their choice. Leave it alone. Yeah, that's right. Amen. That's a human life. It's, that's how you value a human life. It's exactly. You don't value a human life by like being happy that they made a choice and something happened to them either way. Yeah. It yeah. The direction of the choice they make. So that's where that's again how do we get back to that that ground of understanding i don't know it comes from leadership mm -hmm. it comes from people at the top trickling it to bottom down absolutely yeah, yeah. That, it was like that was like the thing i kind of i what went through my head is when i saw you starting to be more outspoken on these things i was like you know chris was like the media training is over i'm out of the nhl i'm going yeah. all in <laughs> well and again right i I worked with Sportsnet and I understand the risks. Right. Will they ever want, you know, they still ask me to come on the radio and I love working at Sportsnet and they've never told me what to say or what not to say. Um, Sweet. I really, you know, they've been amazing to me. Um, but yeah, I'm outspoken mm -hmm. now. Um, I don't think I'm out there peddling crazy conspiracies or, or talking about other things or I'm just asking for lockdowns to be done, people to love each other and the government to stop having so much stupid overreach and insane overreach. And I don't think that's an insane thing to ask for me either. Amen. Seriously. Um, if it is, then I'm an asshole. Yeah. So then I'm good it. with being crazy. Yeah. It's yeah. Off to the that's, gulags. I'm, that's exactly right. I'm good with it then. then yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll sleep at night. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. We'll finish Jeez. off with your question. We'll call it a night. Yeah, this was just the last one. Josh and I were, I mean, just trying to think of something maybe creative. And I think what we came up with was um, obviously a two-time Stanley Cup champion. Incredible. What were you not expecting um, that would come after winning the Stanley Cup? Certainly once but twice. What were you not expecting to happen that did? Um, what was I not expecting? I've never been asked this question before. Hey, okay. that's what I was hoping for. We accomplished it. It probably doesn't <laughs> make any sense, I, I, but I swear to God, I've, I've never been asked this before. Um, maybe just no. I, I expected it, but um, the feeling I felt. Maybe I didn't expect it because I started to feel that emotion. It was when my grandfather lifted the Stanley Cup. Mm. You know, I didn't know. Like I just handed it to him, and then that was something that was unexpected. I just broke down like a baby. Uh, so maybe that was something I, un it was unexpected. I didn't think I was going to cry in front of everyone. You know, I was yeah. pretty tipsy, you know, at my <laughs> party. that'd be an unexpected thing, I guess that happened where I was like a little embarrassed, but, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it was just, I don't know everything that came with it, man. Like, it's just a crazy experience. Yeah. Everything's kind of expected but unexpected right i think the biggest thing and you know what maybe i'm answering this wrong now that i'm starting to think about it the unexpected thing is you you think you those two weeks after you win it's going to be like that forever mm. ah and then the two weeks wears off and you're like oh shit, i'm back to normal oh <laughs> maybe that's kind of unexpected if i'm starting to really like the high runs in. off maybe a little yeah the high wears off and you're like that's ah, over Shit, you know Huh. Um, what a driving yeah. factor to try and do it again though yeah it to is. chase that and then you also realize man it is hell to do it so yeah. i can imagine oh my what you must have put your body through i can only imagine what that felt like yeah i'm still going through it right now yeah i can feel it oh no <laughs> oh no awesome well chris thank you so much for taking the time out uh, it really does mean the world uh, and thank you for sharing your heart um sharing what's yeah. going on with clever i know our listeners have really appreciated it uh we really appreciate it so thank yeah. you so much yeah awesome thanks for having me no problem chris thank have a good so night much. enjoy your Pretty week sure. yeah yeah take care guys thanks. see ya, see ya. That was so what a great guest to have on because like i was saying so like-minded who's able to articulate or give an opinion on things you and I just, I mean, can't, I mean, we can't relate to having children through this pandemic and 
having them in sports while having been an NHL star, what's that like? And uh, I, before this, did not know that he had went to one of the yeah. rallies yeah. and, uh, you know, giving his experience on that, which I know will ruffle, 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 some, ruffle. ruffle some feathers. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he speaks with his heart, and he means every word he says, and I appreciate that about someone. Yeah, exactly. And that's something that we, we said on the podcast numerous times, no matter, no matter where you land on the political spectrum, what you believe, what you don't believe, if you can speak with conviction, that's something I will always respect in you, no matter what. Yep. Um, and so that's why I really appreciate it, Chris. Uh, unapologetic. Take, exactly. Unapologetic, coming on the show, um, you know, two boys from Halifax. Yeah, what do you have to have? No business talking to us. Yeah, but, exactly. Ah. Uh, it was cool to hear about. It will never get old. Yeah, it never will. Uh, and it was great to be able to hear him out, hear how the business is going, how he's kind of developed no. it. He's definitely, well, at least from a business perspective, I don't care what anyone says, he's definitely on the right track. I can he's see an why. entrepreneur. Yeah, for sure. And the the fact he's willing to say I don't know things is shows you are that's you, a leader. You, exactly, you know how to run your business because uh, I've worked the with know people. It all does not win. Exactly, I've seen CEOs who aren't willing to say that, yeah. and the the business doesn't go so well. That's right. Awesome. Well, that was a that was a that was a long one. Oh, that was a good one. That was a good one. We're grateful. We changed this format up a little bit. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. So whatever it is you're doing, whether you be going down to the river, harbor, or the rallies, or watching a hockey game, or whatever it is you're, <laughs> screw it. We love you. We're, We're out. out. Peace. Okay.